About 2,000 years ago, there was in Israel, in Jerusalem, a ruler of the Jews, an important man. He was also a religious man, belonging to the Pharisees. Maybe in today's uh, terms you would say he was a politician as well as an uh, maybe orthodox Jew. He knew the Bible and he kept the law. And this man, Nicodemus, had heard of Jesus and he had observed Jesus from a distance. And he knew from what he saw and what he heard that Jesus was from God. And he wanted to speak with Jesus. But he was afraid and he was ashamed to be seen with Jesus. Potentially it was also dangerous. And so he went by night when it was dark. And if you think of it, that's actually a weak way to start with Jesus, being ashamed and afraid to be associated with him. But even so, Jesus was willing to listen, and he is willing to listen, to answer your questions. Maybe you are a Nicodemite, afraid or ashamed to talk to Jesus or to talk about Jesus and maybe seeking him in the dark of the night when no one can see or hear you. The good news is he is there to listen, even so, to answer and to invite you. This Nicodemus did not want to talk with Jesus about politics or religion. He knew a lot about that, but he simply wanted to talk with Jesus about the salvation of his soul. The funda fundamental issue that all of us must deal with, and many try to avoid as long as possible, even until deathbed. And Jesus speaks to him about the necessity of new birth, being born again. And birth is the beginning of life. So to be born again is to begin life anew. By our first birth we are corrupt. Born, you can say, with a spiritual defect. And therefore we must be made new creatures, having a new nature, new principles, new desires, new goals. And as Nicodemus asks Jesus how this can happen, Jesus gives what arguably has become the most popular verse in all of the Bible, uh, certainly in evangelism, and that is John 3, verse 16. And it says there, and we know it all, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This verse has been explained very often, more often than any other verse, I guess. And at the same time, no verse in the Bible can be so little explained. Actually, the more you read it, the more you will learn that it can only be fully understood by um, experience. And when it is really felt in the heart. The verse speaks about God's love, for so God so loved. And it gives us five attributes of his love, of this love. Um, the first one is its object or target. The second one is its expression. How does this love come out? The third is its recipient, the receivers. The fourth, its intention, the purpose of this love. And the last one is the duration. So, what is the object of God's love? Well, the answer is simple. For God so loved the world. The world is the object of God's love. God loved the world. Notice that it says God loved. 
past tense the world <coughs> it doesn't uh, start now it's not something for the future he loved the world already <coughs> God did not wait for the world to turn to him he loved the world already it's very much like when you're a parent you love your child you don't wait for your child to grow up and to be able to intelligibly uh, express its love for you you love it right away already actually even before it's born and likewise God loves you already this was a totally new idea to Nicodemus the Jews thought and still think that God only loved Israel not the world it was and uh, is a revolutionary idea that God's love is wide enough to embrace all of mankind in fact this is unique to Christianity God loves the world because he loves each one the world is not an abstract concept the world is the collection you can say of all individuals and God loves each one of them every single one incl including you everyone gets as much of the love of God as if he or she was the only one in the entire universe it's again comparable to a certain extent to how parents love their children parents love their children not because they love their children as a collective but because they love each one of them individually so God loves all of us because he loves each of us God loves the world because he loves you now the world in turn does not love God because most people don't love God and not loving God has bad consequences but the fact remains that everyone has God's love resting on him you may drag yourself away from God but you cannot drive him away from you so what is the object of God's love the world you the expression of God's love that is that he gave his only begotten son that is his gift to us he did not just feel sorry for this world that rejects him and say okay too bad no he did something about it and he gave the most precious thing that he had to give his only son and if you have children again try to imagine that you would give up your child certainly if it's your only child for someone that does not love you at all actually that is against you yet that is what God did for you it's not so that because Jesus came and died for our sins that now God can love, can love us no it's the other way around God so loved the world that he gave his only son he loved us first and as a result of that he gave his son God did not just send his son but far more loving he gave his son he gave him up and now when Jesus told this to Nicodemus Nicodemus must have thought of Abram who was asked by God to give up his only begotten son Isaac but God did not allow that to happen and God gave a substitute sacrifice and with that he pointed of course to Jesus and so it was very clear in Nicodemus mind what Jesus was actually saying this is a gift it's a free gift so then who is the recipient of God's love the first thing you may say is the world but that's not correctly so the whole world is the object of God's love which means each individual but most of the world does not receive and therefore does not benefit of that love hence the mess that we are in the gift of the Father is Jesus and you only receive a gift when you believe in him that's what it says here most of the world never unwraps the gift that they 
have been given. It's like you get a gift for your birthday. Um, if you put it on a shelf and you don't unwrap it, you'll never know what's inside. You never have the joy of using or um, uh, seeing that what's inside. And um, actually, it's the same as if it was not given to you. So it is for those that believe. Now, believing in means much more than um, being aware intellectually. Or it's also much more than agreeing with Jesus, uh, with his words. As many say, he was a wise uh, teacher. I agree with, uh, with his teachings. That's not believing in. It's also not uh, a matter of believing about him historically. Uh, many say, I believe that Jesus lived, that he uh, was on this earth. Yeah, okay. So what? <laughs> that's not faith. That's not believing in. That's not what it means. To believe in means to trust, to rely on, and to cling to. You have to lay hold of him firmly and lean on him, on him, hang on to him, flee to him for refuge. Jesus says himself, come to me. And that's an invitation. And it's a beautiful invitation that the Son of God tells you, come to me from all the people he tells you. Of course, he tells all the people, but it's still, as I said before, even if you would have been the only one in the universe, he would still have said, come to me. And uh, in Matthew 4, among other places, he says, follow me. It's not only come to me, and then that's it, and we go our separate ways. No, follow me. Stay on track with me. Following Jesus means you have to unfollow everything else and everyone else. I know unfollow is not proper English, but nowadays in the world of internet, it's actually a word. Um, but think of that. Because many say they are Christians, that they follow Jesus, but in reality they are following a myriad of other voices and uh, people and things. Um, and with that actually they show that they are not following Jesus. What's the intention of God's love? Why does God ex express his love toward men? Well, ask this uh, to yourself. Why do you express your love toward someone else? Why? Because you want to please them. You want to make them feel good. You want to make them feel safe and happy. God's love does that to men. But on a grand and on an eternal scale. He actually saves men from eternal destruction. God does not want humanity to perish. And thus he extends the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. That is the intention. That no one should perish. Now what's the duration of God's love? Now since the intention is not to perish, the result is to live. It's not just life, but it's everlasting life. Because God's love will never change, it will never end. And neither does the life that results from his gift. But once we are delivered from eternal death, we are to enjoy eternal life in his presence. Now the love of God is limitless. It embraces all mankind. No sacrifice was too great to deliver that love. He gave the best that he had to give. His only Son. And though it is offered to all, it can only be received by those who realize their fallen and lost state, and thus turn to Jesus for salvation. It's a free gift, but it's not a cheap one. It's not me saying that to you, it's not the church saying that to you, it's not religion saying that to you. No, it's Jesus himself. This verse, John 3.16, is Jesus himself speaking. He is actually speaking also about himself. Why he is there. He says, whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
whoever, he says, whoever. That includes you. It's a direct invitation. All this life is here on this earth is ultimately about uh, answering this uh, invitation. And there are only two options. You either choose life or death. God already loves you. He so loved the world, so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen.